Welcome to Home Gym History, produced by Garage Gym Radio. My name is Rob, and you can find me on Vintage Weights PGH on YouTube and Instagram. And tonight, I'm so fortunate to have Elaine Ewing from Rhinebeck Pilates and Sean Gallagher. And they are, in my humble opinion, experts on Pilates and the history of it. I'm coming into this, as I just told them when we were chatting before recording, pretty blind. I mean, I, I don't know much at all about Pilates. So listeners, if you're in the same camp as I am, you're in for a treat because as I've dug into this to form questions for these two, I have found a newfound fascination and I can't wait to get some advice on how to incorporate Pilates into some of the strength training I'm already doing. We're hopefully going to get into the history of Pilates when it comes to Joe Pilates and how it was uh, conceived and developed. And then, of course, the equipment. I love talking about fitness equipment. So welcome, Elaine and Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yes. for having us. So could you give a, a brief you know, background of yourselves? Sean, you can go ahead. All right. So, uh, well, I, I, um, I'm a physical therapist. I've been doing Pilates since mid to late 80s. Um, I am a fellow Christ practitioner. I have done a lots of other different modalities. I've, I've you know, studied osteopathy in Canada and in the U.S., acupuncture in Asia. <clears throat> so I've done a lot of different things. And when I opened my physical therapy practice, one of the first things I did was put a Pilates apparatus you know, program in. in the, so it was always, I've always had Pilates and PT together. I also, um, I have a degree in dance. I got a degree in dance and physical therapy at the same time. And I've been working on Broadway, uh, taking care of performers since 1987. And I've done 188 shows now. Wow. Backstage. So <laughs> that is quite an extensive resume you have. And then Elaine? Uh, well, I um, started doing Pilates in 1999, uh, started practicing Pilates. And then um, in the year 2000, thousand I became certified. Um, I was going to art school at the time and I sort of needed like a side job to make some money to pay the bills and things. So I decided to become a Pilates teacher so I could work part time teaching Pilates and then do my art on the side and basically just went straight into Pilates from there and have been teaching it ever since then. So it's been my main job for pretty much my entire adult life. <laughs> <laughs> that's not yeah. a bad thing. I, I mean, from what I see on your Instagram, Elaine, that's how I connected with yeah. you was on Instagram. I'm always fascinated. You know, it's uh, we live in a generational culture of scrolling through mm -hmm. things, if you're so inclined to do so. And I stop when I see your post because I'm like, well, okay, first of all, what is she doing? <laughs> and second of all, what is the contraption she's doing this totally. with? And it's fascinating. Cool. So I guess I would ask first, uh, and I'll direct this to you, mm -hmm. Elaine, how would you summarize Pilates just in general, the, the benefits of it? What is okay. it? Um, well, there is uh, mat work and there's apparatus work. So, you know, what you were talking about, the contraptions that you see on my Instagram page, um, that's what we call the apparatus. So it's usually using spring tension and or it may have like a surface such as, you know, like a flat mat, or we have some apparatus called the barrels. So that's a curved surface. So, you know, there's different configurations that you can basically incorporate uh, stability and mobility and strength and stretch and control all at the same time within each exercise uh, throughout all planes of motion. That's fantastic. <laughs> and even as you name some of those things, I'm in my head, I'm thinking, okay, I know what she's talking about. The mm -hmm. barrels I can recognize. Yeah. I've been paying attention. <laughs> so then Sean, digging into the history of it, Pilates was not, you know, a made up title for this practice. That's a man. That's Joe Pilates. Yeah. So uh, could you give us, you know, what you know about Joe Pilates, well, or at least we that know, we could fit into this? You know, he was born in 1883. And, you know, at that time, you had the gymna German gymnastics taught in the schools. His father was a gymnastic teacher. So he was exposed to that. And uh, he went to, uh, I think it was 1914, he went to England to work for a circus. And his act was a human Greek statue. So he had the, you know, the body. Okay. And uh, then he was interned in the Isle of Man. 
during the war because mm. of his heritage. But when he was there, they, you know, when the war broke out, boxing was not really legal in Germany, but it was legal in, in Britain. So the, the Germans, they, that was one of the things that they had them do. So there was all these boxing matches. So, oh, wow. And there was a lot of uh, Germans who then after the war that were at the Isle of Man went back and started opening boxing centers. And Joe was one of those. So he had a boxing center and he started to develop his own apparatus uh, the first we see, you know, uh, but he also talks, he says that the mat work originally started there's a, in the archives, the writing, it says 1902. And then, you know, the, the first, his first uh, patent was for a foot corrector apparatus, just for the, we call it the foot corrector. And then okay. there was the, the universal, and he called it the universal reformer, mm. right? So it wasn't just a reformer. He called it the universal reformer. So it took care of everything. And, you know, what he, what he says is that, you know, the mat work, he would do all the work. So he invented an apparatus that would do the work for him so that he could fine tune and, <laughs> and do the hands on and he wouldn't have to do all the pushing and pulling, uh, you know, but he still did it. When you, when you look at his pictures of him teaching, he's always doing hands. He's always in there and he's practicing, you know, when we teach, we always talk about practicing Pilates as you teach Pilates because you, mm. you're doing the work. And, you know, one of the things that he did is that he, you know, he looked at babies and animals. And he said, well, how do they move? How do they learn how to move and how do they move? So he used that process. And, and that was, you know, in the 19, in the teens or the twenties. Mm -hmm. And by the 1950s, you had physical therapists starting to ask the same kind of questions. And they, and now, you know, for when they had babies and people that had strokes and other things, how do we retrain people? So there's this, what well, they started looking at, how do we first learn to move? And, you know, I, the question I always ask is who taught you how to move? <laughs> <laughs> right. Nobody. That's a good question. It's, hard, it's hardwired into the system. Right? Yeah. And, and we and we go through this sequence and we go mm. through this developmental sequence where we do certain things. And, you know, the timeline is different. You know, I always talk about a bell curve. So, you know, at either end, there's extremes, but most of us fit in that bell curve. And so those what he he did is he looked at that and he facilitates that into the, the system. So we're on our backs. We're on our sides. We're on our stomach. We kneel. We sit. We pipe. We stand. But the difference is he has apparatus that has springs mm. and to move, right, to move, we always need stability and mobility. And a lot of times in the gyms and with weights, it's more about the mobility and not so much about the stability. Sure. But with Joe's, with, yeah, with Joe's, well, core, you know, I went to PT school in, in the 80s. Nobody talked about the core. Nobody talked about, you know, the center, any of that stuff. There was. It, the only time they said anything was in NDT, which is neurodevelopmental training, which was the, the tra training I'm talking about that the PTs developed in the 50s, talking about how to retrain people. And you need proximal stability for distal motor control, fine motor control. If you if you don't have stability here, you can't do any, you can't manipulate anything, right? That That's the reality. So that's one of the things that they did. So that was part of the process. And his apparatus with the springs, you, you know, traditionally, when you want to get stronger, what do you have to do with the resistance? What do you have to do with the resistance? Traditionally, yeah. to, uh, to get stronger, what do you increase, have to do? With? Increase the resistance, you know, right. progressive overload. You just, mm -hmm. you know, whether well, you go Pilates, back to, to Milo Pilates, and, and right. the bull, you yeah. know, okay. whatever you want to make the comparison. But, but in Pilates, mm -hmm. on certain exercises on the apparatus, if you take the resistance away, the exercise becomes harder to do. Interesting. So you build strength. So okay. you and and basically what it is, it's a balance between the stability and the mobility. And most of the time, the mobility is in the extremities, right? And mm -hmm. you know the hips and the shoulders, and then through the extremities. And then the core has to do its own thing because there, there's always an underlying postural support system, right? And that's yeah. that's always there. So he understood that, and he and he made his equipment so that. When you see each exercise, the spring mm -hmm. setting is for most people a balance between that stability and that mobility. And okay. if you add a spring, it it goes into the shoulders and the hips and has more mobility. And if you take a spring away, it then goes into the core. So when you do the exercise the way he set it up on his apparatus, it's a balance between those two. So and the then interplay you do it through, right, and then you do them. it through the inner through the developmental sequence. So you you you're reinforcing. The things that we first did to learn how to move, right? You know, if you don't gotcha. use it, you lose it. So yeah. it's different than, you know, because weights tends to be, you know, and traditionally, right, even even um, functional, you know, movement mm -hmm. now, it's all the big thing, right? Well, sure. you know, Carlos Santana, who's one of the first guys that did it, you know, I used to do uh, conferences and he would be there at some of them. And he was talking about, you know, one of his brochures said, 
breaking the bonds of, you know, of traditionalism. And in the background, you, you know, there's a Pilates reformer and the exercise he's doing is, was one of the exercises that I have in the archives that Joe did and not just Joe, other people. So it's like, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's not really breaking the bonds of traditionalism. It's, it's, it's function. And, and Joe was doing that a hundred years ago. Well, you know, it's when it comes to his inspiration with looking at animals, looking at babies, looking at young children, this has been, I mean, I've seen uh, Squat University and various other entities put up, you know, a picture of a, a young child squatting, but I have young children at home. I have four young children of my own. And there are so many times that I'll see my two-year-old squat down and I'll think to myself, that's, that's the goal right there. I, I won't, like you said, I, I, I want to maintain that. I want to be able to do that. And you know, there's a, there's a balance in terms of weightlifting and strength pursuits that, yeah, that a balance exists mm -hmm. where sometimes athletes, I think, go full throttle into their goals of lifting X amount of weights or doing this endeavor at the cost of some of that. Whereas Pilates, uh, when I was reading Rhinebeck, the website for Rhinebeck Pilates, Rhinebeck, I believe it's RhinebeckPilates.com. Mm -hmm. Right, Elaine? There's a wonderful history that Elaine has on there. And when I was reading that, it, it stood out to me that the part about the internment, mm -hmm. when uh, in England, he was put into an internment camp because of his German heritage, World War One had kicked off. And then you mentioned the springs, Elaine, and so did you, Sean. And what was the tie with the bed springs? I mean, he was training, seeing he was training the other members of this internment mm -hmm. camp while he was in there. And was it the bed springs that he started kind of hooking up to well, there, work through that? Pilates, what, what's, what's the story with well, that? Well, you know, as you probably can tell from my Instagram and my work, you know, Sean and I's work together and my history on the page is like, we've done, a, Sean and I do a lot of uh, research into Pilates history. And yes. um, there's a lot that we know, and there's also a lot that we don't know still. And there's also things that are sort of like myths or questions that we... That's yeah, what I'm getting at. Like, we just want to find out. So one of the Pilates yeah. legends, I guess you could say, is that he mm -hmm. developed his apparatus because he was in the internment camp and there were beds mm -hmm. and people were in bed and he decided to take the springs off of the beds and hook them up to the headboard and he had people pull on the springs and he created apparatus that way. It's, it's a great, a great story. story and <laughs> it's definitely yeah. intriguing um, and it makes, you know, mm. a nice way to, to draw people into the idea of Pilates, although it's probably not sure. true because um, yeah. the, the beds there were either not metal or if okay. they were metal beds, they had like tiny springs that were like the size of your pinky underneath the mattresses. Uh, and gotcha. They went yeah. all the way around and they were frame and they would hook to the wire frame so yeah they would it'd bow back and forth but they weren't springs all the, you know because his springs in his apparatus are usually this long okay or longer yeah. you know some are longer some are shorter there's very there's sure a, a, there is so there we're not talking place... a matter of inches the spring in an apparatus might be a foot right. two feet yeah. Yeah. right yeah, right exactly. yeah so there's a big, there's difference. A big difference so and, and i mean he's not alone in that and it, it in terms of a history versus lore and fact versus oh, legend yeah. on the last episode of home gym history, I was speaking with Zach Evanesh about uh, Bob Hoffman mm. of York barbell and some of the kind of tall tales he would tell cool. of, you know, I, I found this barbell or I did this and I did that. And Zach was talking about these things, but I think, you know, there's certainly fact in what you said, Sean, that Joe Pilates father was a gymnast and that at the time and physical culturists, will know this very well that at the time gymnastics was taught in various European countries as just a, a normal school curriculum. Right. So there's that history there. And then also, like you mentioned, I find, I mean, it's a very, it's almost cinematic The his young life. I, I would love to see a movie of his young life where he's, you know, in England at this time. And then he, you know, he, he gets involved in the circus. Yeah. It made me think of Eugene Sandow, totally. for yeah. example. With the, the posing yeah. that you mentioned, that was oh, his yeah, act exactly. that he would pose as Greek sculptures. And that was very much a Sandow yeah. kind of thing. So yeah, and then the boxing. Mm -hmm. So that's where some of the Pilates different things that I found off of your website. And that's what I started bouncing things off of. Okay, this is what Elaine has in her history versus what I find mm -hmm. elsewhere, because I want to ask you. So influences going into it, you mentioned animals and young children, but then these experiences with the circus mm -hmm. and boxing, do you see that in the development of the different 
apparatus or the different movements, yeah. the different, should I call them exercises mm -hmm. that yeah, for sure. Joe developed? Yeah, yeah. Some of the exercises are named after animals. Okay. Right. So you have that. We also, there is a whole, uh, basically shadow boxing series that he does in a standing mat. So his mat wasn't, you know, so he had mat work, which is on the floor to take the stress off the heart and all these other things. But he also had a standing program that did a fair amount of jumping. And, and that was, you know, if you look at, you know, the exercise from the 1945 prior to that, a lot of the exercise was standing exercise. When you look at a lot of the old books, especially gymnastics or the calisthenics for the women, right? Because men did gymnastics with apparatus. Women did calisthenics with, with, with was more mat work and, not always, but that was a, there was a big differentiation then. So, but so he had that. There is uh, he invented. I, I have a blueprint for an apparat, a boxing apparatus, and had you know all these things, different ways you could punch the apparatus. So you know wow. there was things that he was trying to do all the time. What what's interesting is with the exercise, a lot of people say if he was alive today, he would change everything because of what we know. And he always said he was fifty years ahead of his time. And uh, you know I'm in the process of writing a book on you know, the body systems related to how he looked at them. And basically, if you look at the science and what he said, guess what? He was 50 years ahead of his time. So <laughs> it's not like, let's, let's take the science and we're going to improve what Pilates did. It's like, they're saying, well, what he said to do is pretty much what we should be doing in a lot of cases. Not, you know, he wasn't a hundred percent, but a lot of it is, there's a lot of, of backup for, for that. So. Well, just what you said about the apparatus or not, I think he was ahead of his time because when I look at the dates and I bounce them off what I know of gym equipment and weightlifting equipment, the development of the Pilates apparatus were, was predating a lot of the equipment that's commonly found Definitely. in home gyms today and for weightlifting today. When it comes to what you said about your background, Sean, with dance and what I had read, he, Joe, then he comes to the United States, meets his wife. And they open up a Pilates studio, the mm -hmm. first one, and that is in New York City, correct? correct? Yep. And then from there, where does the story go? How do we, because you mentioned dance, and am I correct that I read that it was in rehabilitation purposes with dancers or helping to strengthen the dancers in the Broadway scene and in New York City that really uh, affected the business over the years in a positive way? Well, I have um, sign-in books from the studio. There's I'm, no I'm better proof fifth, than I'm, that. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the fifth <laughs> owner of the business. I bought the Pilates business. I'm the fifth owner, and I and I, I got archival work. I got and I have the books. Amazing. And so a lot of the famous dancers are in there, but the majority of people were not dancers. Oh. You know, there's lawyers, there's bankers, there's housewives, there's you know you name it. So he had all sorts of people. And and what and and there was a lot of people that had nothing to do with dance. And, and matter of fact, his original studio was you know nine three nine Eighth Avenue, which is on Fifty Fourth, which is where the old Mad close to where the old Madison Square Garden was. He originally came to the U.S. but, but Nat Fleischer, uh, you know, uh, supported him. And you know, when Nat went over to Germany, we have a a, a historical record of showing that Joe and him met in Germany. So there's wow. a connection and he came here to work with boxers and I have old film of him working with a boxer who was going to go on to, you know, do a, a bout on at Madison Square Garden. So he came in in 26, opened in 27, we think we're not, you know, it's somewhere right around there. But, and, but the dancers didn't get to him until the thirties. So, okay. So initially you know, and, and, Madison Square right. Garden, boxers, right. right. And other people and, everybody, and just and, everyday mm -hmm. people. Right. It was wow. more everyday people than, you know, sure. and, and there were some famous ones. Look, in my, my practice, I do a lot of Broadway sales, you know, but the majority, you know, half of my business is not performers. It's bankers and housewives and, and, and business people and, you know, uh, and, you know, stay at home dads, you know, you name it. I get a, I get a little bit of everything. So sure. that's so, but at the same time, there are, some, I, I can, there's plenty of people that are famous that I've worked on. I don't mention them, but. You know, like he did, you know, he was marketing and all that <laughs> stuff. So I, I, I keep it quiet. <laughs> well, that's part of why, you know, that's yeah. like the uh, impression that he taught a lot of dancers, which he did teach a lot of dancers. But like Sean was saying, there's also the, you know, lots of a mix of people, just like any gym would have a variety of, of people that come. Part of why uh, it seems like he had a lot of dancers was because, uh, and performers, was that they were famous. So they would have articles written about them 
And part of the article uh, would say, oh, and they also do exercise at this gym. And then they show a picture of them with Joseph Pilates. So that's how he was able to start marketing his business was because a lot of the articles would mention Joe, but they were actually about the person who was the famous person. Um, but then on top of that, yeah. you know, his students. It's a good way to yeah, get exactly. clients. And, and, and similar, like to what I was saying, you know, I went to art school and I was an artist and needed a side job, right? So I decided I would teach Pilates. Well, that's how the teachers at his gym began. I mean, they were dancers and they needed to have a side job. So they became trained by him and then they started teaching Pilates at his studio and eventually they started to go out and, you know, move to California or move away or, or stayed in New York City too. And that's how they actually spread the method around was because of, mm. of that experience. So the dancers, you know, they, they actually ended up being how his method was preserved too in the end. Matter of fact, most of, most of the elder teachers, the teachers that study with Joe or that, those are almost all of them are dan mm -hmm. ex dancers. Hmm. So the regular people didn't go. The dancers went because they could do the work pretty well because they've already spent ten or twenty years training their bodies to get flexible and strong. But they were still in balance because the choreography. So Joe, Joe would, you know, they they, they get, went to Joe to undo what the dan you know nobody pays to see normal, <laughs> right? That's what I always say. True. So when dancing, you're doing all sorts of abnormal things, and you go to Joe to put it all back in in place and back together, right? That's sort that of makes what a lot did. of sense. And and they also, they are trained to look at movement for their profession. So when you go and you're looking at a, a, a profession that is teaching people how to move and looking at how they move and te teaching them, the answer is, you know, they they, they come with, a, you know, a ready-made foundation that, that most people that if you were working at, at a bank, you don't have where the dancer does. So that, so most of those, those teachers were all dancers because he would also allow them to come and do a, a fair amount of work you know, if, if they would teach and, and things like that. So it was, a, you know, every, they both benefited. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think that's a kind of a tried and true thing across all kinds of athletic endeavors, you know, and even just personal kind of histories. I remember my wife, you know, growing up was an equestrian and she worked at the stable as a way of paying for her ability to ride the horses and whatnot, you know, well, chip away yeah. at the cost, that kind of thing. So it makes sense. And I, what I'd like to do, though, is talk a little bit about the equipment and the apparatus, to use the term correctly. You mentioned the Universal Reformer. I've seen that name before, but I, and we can certainly drop a picture. I'll get your permission, Elaine, uh, to please use some of the pictures from your website. So we can drop a picture in there. But essentially, what is it? If I, if I were to look at a Universal Reformer, what am I looking at? Uh, how is it basically used? Well, if you picture like maybe like a, a, a small single size bed, a twin bed, right? You picture that a, a bit smaller. It would have, uh, we call it a carriage, but it's like a, a mat that has two shoulder blocks and a headpiece. And you could lie down on your back. There's a bar that we call the foot bar. And you'd put your feet on the bar. And then that carriage is attached to the frame by springs. So traditionally, there's four springs. They're all the same weight. And there's 70 to 100 exercises that you can do with different spring settings and in different positions. You'd lie on your back, be in sort of like a plank position, pushing back and forth. You'd be sideways, kneeling, standing. You know, there's all the different uh, planes of motion and, and positions. And you go through a whole routine. Um, there's an order. So there's a sequence of exercises. And from start to finish, you basically move through, you know, all those planes of motion uh, with the different spring settings, working different parts of your body. And by the time you're finished, it takes about an hour to complete the entire series. Uh, by the time you're finished, you've worked every muscle and, you know, every configuration. So that's the full body workout that you get at the end. How many exercises are in a series in the sequence? In an hour? Well, it depends. Uh, we have we have or different sequences. So we have what we call basic, intermediate, and advanced. So it just depends on your level. Um, if you're Where you yeah, are. if you're just yeah. starting out, you're going to do less exercises and also less intricate exercises. Okay. 
So that would take less than yeah. an hour. But then the idea is that you would move on to doing the mat work and then you'd move on to doing different spring work. So it would still take an hour, but um, you would ideally mm -hmm. use different apparatus throughout that hour. The more you advance, the more you okay. can do more complicated exercises and you could take a whole hour on the reformer because you know a full yeah. repertoire. So, so then, yeah. go ahead, one of Sean. The things, one of the things that he did is that he, one of the problems with exercise is what, you know, people, it's, it's time or place. I don't have the place. I don't have the time. So, you know, he not only had the studio equipment, but he had equipment that you could also have at home. He had home equipment. He had a mm -hmm. whole line of home equipment in the forties that were based on the other things. So he was always sort of finding new ways to be able to still do basically the same exercises or variations that are similar, but in different apparatus. So he invented, you know, there's a couple different chairs. There's, you know, there's, you know, the reformer. He had a portable reformer that folded in half oh, wow. at home, you know, and, and, you know, and that was in the 40s. So he had all these and he, he was always... It, but what he didn't change too much was the exercise because he felt that he knew what he was doing and he used it on his body. Like one of you things, you know, you say you want to be able to do that squat. Well, his whole philosophy was that I remember there's one article where he, he, he bends over, slaps the floor, comes up and he says, can the Pope do that? You know, it's like basically, <laughs> you know, all the people, the men in power, if they were in shape and did what he did and his philosophy and way of living and working, they would be much better people. And, and it's about, you know, when I when I teach Pilates instructors, I, I I have a chart, and it says with and without Pilates. And with you know, I start at zero, right? Where every everything you do needs somebody needs to clean you, feed you, dress you, you know, all those things, right? And as you have babies, you know. And then Absolutely. we you know we 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 grow until our twenties. I mean, things can happen with younger, but you know, most of us we hit our prime in our you know mid to mid twenties to thirties, and then what happens? You either you go on this downward spiral, and at the end, what do you need? Somebody to do all those things for you. Or as Joe's did, you know, you know, you get an injury and you keep doing your stuff and you go back up and you go down and you go back up, you go down, and then at the end, you die. You know, so at 87, you know, or, you know, when he died a, a couple months before, he could still do all these exercises and wow. do all the functional stuff. And that's really, I mean, that's the lifestyle he's talking about, being able to do that for a life, you know, for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when you look at the, you know, when I look at, the, you know, weightlifting and you look at the guys who really get pumped up, how many of those guys are doing that at 80 yeah. or, you know, 60 Not or 70 many. years? Not right. Many. Well, you know, that's the, so this is a system that you can do for a lifetime mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't strain you like that, you know, and again, when you look at, at, at weights, right, when it was first started, what was a, a lot of it was for what? For the eye for candy. weight training? Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of it was eye candy. Single Some muscle, of it, muscle sure. Group, yeah, but that was the that was the balance group. between strength and right. and appearance. But yes, right, sure. Yeah. And, and it and it and it and it focused on single muscle or, or muscle or or muscle groups. It didn't mm -hmm. look at and when you look at every every exercise Joe does, everything's always working. It's just working different ways. Yeah, I mean, I'm in my 40s, and I uh, by no means uh, am I an elite lifter of any type, I, uh, just physical fitness and enjoying myself. And I just like it, but yeah. I certainly enjoy, uh, setting a new personal record, lifting, you know, the most that I've ever lifted. And I, that's what intrigues me a lot with strength history is reading accounts of things that people did that are extraordinary, but there's the balance. And that's what I really love about what you said earlier, Sean, with Pilates and the balance, because I think there's just a balance in any strength endeavor in my opinion that like you said you can only push it so long until your body starts breaking down and that's true for any athlete you look at professional athletes and major sports and things like that okay. they can only and dancers you know go show so me a long. 70 year old dancer doing what they did at 20. exactly so there has to be a balance a give and a take and when it comes to pilates um you know just having good posture having just everyday life ability it seems appealing. <laughs> and so that leads me to, um, you know, some of these other apparatus, which the barrels, they remind me of, to make a connection to gym equipment, they remind me of glued ham developers. Like It's like a half circle mm -hmm. apparatus. Mm -hmm. How did, what's the history of the barrels? Were 
did he just have barrels at one point that he then was <laughs> well, uh, there, leaning there's, there's over? A story, there, there's a story with that too. There's always okay. a story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to you want to tell the story, Elaine? Oh yeah, sure. Well, you know, in our Sean and I actually recently presented a workshop on the history of the barrels, and we were doing research about that very question. And one of those Pilates myths that I was talking about earlier was that oh, uh, because you know, Joe Pilates was a big beer drinker. So the myth was, oh, you know, one day Joe had a beer barrel, an empty beer barrel, and he cut it in half. And that was the barrel that became the barrel. So to me, I was always like, well, how would that work? Like, wouldn't it just fall apart if you cut a beer barrel in half? It would just collapse down. Like, that wouldn't work. Sure. So <laughs> I actually. Because we're not talking about a keg, a metal keg. We're talking about like a wooden, wooden barrel, barrel yeah. with slats. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, like, it's, it's like the barrels that they have wine in still. Yeah. Exactly. They don't do that for beer, but they still do that for wine because they, or, or whiskey or one of those, you know, some of the other. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Spirits. Yes. Well. That he liked to drink. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, Sean and I each happen to own um, a, a, a lot of original apparatus that Joseph Pilates either made or that came from his studio. And um, so I have one of his original barrels. Actually, I have two of his original barrels and Sean has uh, one. They're, the three of them are different. But um, two of them, one of mine and, and Sean's has those wooden slats inside. So, hmm. you know, I was like, all right, well, he did do it that way, but this is not a beer barrel. So where did this design come from? So uh, during our, my research before the workshop, I wanted to be able to present a little more history behind where he may have gotten this idea. And uh, I, I, I learned that there was a type of actually cabinet making that involved mm. putting wooden slats together and making a curve because at that time, this was in the 1940s, I think, um, at that time, uh, they didn't have a way to actually curve wood the way they do now. So you had to create a curve yourself by putting little pieces of wooden slats together. So uh, through continuous research, I ended up finding um, a book from 1940s, early 1940s, and inside it, it was about cabinet making. So um, inside, I found a page that was a description and it had, you know, how to build cabinets. And it literally had an exact picture of how to build <laughs> the barrel. And that's actually the barrel that Sean has, the exact barrel of that. And, and it had the, all the details, everything. Oh, that is cool. And I was like, I showed him, I was like, look, this looks just like your barrel. So <laughs> Sean actually owns... Um, a portion of Joseph Pilates' original library. So okay. he said, well, let me look in the library. I'll see if I have that book. And he actually did have that exact book. Joseph Pilates had that book that had that page in it to show how to make the curved cabinet, which was the barrel that Sean has that was from Joe. <laughs> so basically yeah. he designed the barrel based on maybe, you know, he had that book, but it, you know, he may have also known about how to make you know, curved pieces of wood like that. But it Very seems cool. as though, yeah, it was literally from that exact, that, that book that the barrel was formed. But it's a little, uh, I guess more, a, a little more fun to say, oh, he, he likes to drink beer and he cut one in half exactly one day and started right. exactly. exercising on yes, it. Yes, yeah. because I have Joe. Yes. Joe told, told a lot of tall tales. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we've have since found out that a lot of them are true. But people still tell the tall tale because it's better <laughs> and it sounds more dynamic than like what really happened. And that, that happens all the time. Yeah. You know, it's like the story is sure. still better than the reality. So people still tell yeah. like to tell the story. And, and if you tell that story to your client, they're like, wow, if you tell them, well, he just, you know, made it from a cabinet. <laughs> it's, like, oh. it's really true. It's really true. Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. That's exactly the experience. And then, um, you know, I love to talk about, cause, cause these all, these, some of these ideas came from Joe himself in those articles on my website that you're talking about. Like he, he has a lot of sound bites. Like, you know, he says, oh, you know, he'll say something about himself and it sounds, you know, so out there. Um, because he was basically trying to market himself and stand out from all the other physical mm -hmm. culturists at the time. And Absolutely. yeah, even though we find out as we go along through research that a lot of these things aren't true, what is true is that his marketing worked because we're yeah. still talking about it. And <laughs> it's just the exercises that, yeah. you know, right. 
even if the way he was selling it mm -hmm. may have been a tall tale, right. what he was selling yeah. was not exactly. You know, right. He just had to tale. get your attention. I mean, because there's yeah. you know a lot of competition. You know, even back then. Sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, just the same way a, a classic old time strongman and like mm -hmm. a, a leopard, you know, yeah. you know, weightlifting uniform may have not <laughs> actually wrestled and killed that leopard. Yeah. On the other hand, can that old time strongman lift a lot of weight overhead? That's sure. Right. Yeah. And that's where I see a lot of uh, commonality with Joe Pilates yeah. and what you're telling me with old time strongman pursuits. Oh, and right. I mentioned Eugene Sandow before, mm -hmm. but I also think just in the marking of it, because that was a time and era before organized weightlifting. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm talking about is the late 1800s and 1900s when there wasn't an organized weightlifting going on. Mm -hmm. So then these strongmen had to promote themselves. That's how they made their money, yeah. showing up at the theater and putting on an act. Right. So they were larger than life, not just, you know, literally right. because of what they lifted, but yeah. because, you know what, the dumbbell that's really big looks cool. Totally. So, yeah. you know, that's well, better and, than... And, and exactly. That's what they did. And Joe did the same thing. Like, yeah. You know, like today, you have a hard time because there's Google. Mm -hmm. And you tell me something and I go look it up. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not accurate. They didn't do that back then. I mean, Joe said he was he, he was the descendant of Pontius Pilate. Huh. We that's find amazing. out that he wasn't, but he said that. And the writer, you know, the writer back then, you took them for word and you wrote down what they said. And that's in the article. So then when people read that, they're like, oh, he's descended from Pontius Pilates. But <laughs> His name somebody, looks like it. Not, there was there was somebody who wrote there was, you know, there's been some biographies on Joe and the people who went and studied. They went to Germany found the, the the birth records and found that he was not that you know so but mm -hmm. that's what they do mm -hmm. okay. yeah it, well uh, and i mean it, it's one of these things that i find fascinating and i will say for the past you know couple of weeks i've been looking into this and it's it was hard for me bouncing around online so even though we have google it's hard for me to sort out what's true what is and so that's why it's great to speak to the two of you mm -hmm. because it, you mentioned it in passing sean but you know, if a listener missed it, you purchased back in the 1990s, correct? You purchased the yeah, 1992. Pilates. I, I, I okay. bought. Well, I bought the, the. I'm the fifth owner of the Pilates original Pilates business. And then you also purchased his estate. I think it said I, on. Well, well, I, I so that was in, 90, in Massachusetts. 1997. I bought. Okay. It, what was his original property? Yes. But when I bought it, he was invited up to Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival you know, because the dancers, he got it connected in the forties. And so he kept trying to talk Ted Sean, who was the founder of, of Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival to, you know, you don't want to do this dancing. Let's turn this into a health club spa type of thing. And, and that wasn't happening. So he literally went around the corner, bought 56 acres and he, you know, he built a house, he built a studio. He, there was an old hunting shack that he turned into a, a you know, a, like a bed and breakfast or a, you know, a, a guest house. Mm -hmm. which we're going to be we're in the process of rebuilding and i just we just finished rebuilding his studio and have all that stuff so he yeah. you know and that was his other thing it was like he wanted to have a place in the country where he could do the training as well so mm -hmm. and i'm re i'm i'm sort of bringing that back to life that is so cool so i mean i i feel very fortunate to be talking to the uh you know i would wager to of the Pilates experts that I could possibly speak to. So when it comes to Universal Reformer, the barrels, I heard mention of Cadillac. Yeah. Trapeze so, table or Cadillac. Trapeze table or Cadillac. You mentioned a couple of the smaller devices. Let's take this. You already started going down this road, Sean. But when it comes to the home gym, you, Joe was forward thinking that, hey, maybe not everyone can make it here. I'll put out a catalog, they can order some things, they can do this at home. What types of things would I see in there? What types of things, if it's, I think you said the 1940s, would I have in the home? And then can you fast forward, so this is a two-part question, what kind of things in the home gym setting could I have to practice Pilates at home now, 2023? Well, basically, uh, you know, like Sean had mentioned earlier, there's the, the, the portable reformer, um, the home reformer, uh, which is called the junior reformer. Yeah, it's called, called the junior, it's reformer. Called the nice. junior reformer. Um, it had like a, a, a less extensive repertoire than the universal reformer. It was more simplistic. We actually have, well, Sean has 
uh, one of the originals um, in his Pilates museum. And then we also uh, share another original too that he has of a junior reformer. So they're, they're on the floor. Um, they're a little bit more rustic, I guess you could say than the universal reformer. Then he also had uh, a, what he called a folding mat. So that mat would fold in half. And then when you wanted to work out, you could open it up and unfold it. And then you could do your mat work. Um, I have an okay. original one of those too from Joe. Also in the catalog was one of those small barrels like I was talking about. So you could do mm. um, an entire repertoire with that following charts too. So he would create this home apparatus and then with it would be would come a chart and it had instructions um, and either photos or drawings on it that would show you what to do. Sean, what else did he have? Well, he had the, the, the one to chair for well, home. And he had the one to chair for home. And, and the, the, you know, the wonder chair was like the, really one of the first home gyms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell because me about the wonder chair. Yeah. I love so the, the title. Wonder chair, the wonder, the wonder chair, chair. Was, it, it was, it was a chair. Uh huh. And you would sit on it and when it's padded and you could sit and you could have it in your apartment, your house, whatever. And then when you're ready, you would flip it and take the pad out and there was a pedal underneath the pad. Oh, and then nice. you would attach the springs and you had 70 exercises you could do on that apparatus. So, that you know, cool. and one of the things I always say, you know, when it comes to apparatus and equipment is, you know, what today, what do people, you know, why do they make gym apparatus? Mm-hmm. To make money. Uh, just to make right? money. You know, I mean, that's a business. Right? Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a business. But, you know, when you look at it, you go to a lot of gyms and they have, you know, mm -hmm. and again, if you're pumping and you're doing light weights, you know, it's, if it's one muscle or one muscle group, you have to have how many different pieces of apparatus? Joe's yeah. apparatus, you could have one apparatus and work the whole body and have 70 exercises. And you didn't have to do circuits or anything. It was anything a universal. Yeah. yeah. Right. You could you, you universal. So all that stuff was in the catalog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, the home gym community, and uh, I feel safe saying this, that most home gym owners value versatility, that you only have so much space. Like here in my basement gym, I only have my little footprint that is, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to have. So, I, I, you know, real estate is a premium in this little <laughs> footprint of my gym. So mm -hmm. if it's a piece of equipment that can only do one thing, oh, I, I don't really like that. Right. So that's where something like that would appeal to me, the wonder chair that, whoa, I can do 70 exercises on this thing? Like, yeah. sign me up. Yeah. So, Stay with the reformer. Yeah, exactly. And it can fold in half. I can tuck it over here mm -hmm. and then bring it out. Yeah. So now let's fast forward to the second part of my question there. So here we are in 2023. I saw in Rhinebeck Pilates, mm -hmm. there's virtual Pilates, yeah. you know, yeah. so I'm very curious. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I were to pick the absolute most beginner form of that mm -hmm. <laughs> what what would i need or what would be good mm -hmm. to pursue pilates at home well well yes go ahead. okay i was gonna say go most ahead. people start out at home with the mat um it's okay. it's yeah it's the easiest thing to have it's probably the least expensive thing to buy it's just you know a mat on the floor yeah. and like like the reformer there's a, an entire sequence there's also basic intermediate and advanced so you know you'd start with specific things that are the basic movements and then gradually as you become better and better you add more complicated movements and um until you have a full hour's worth of exercises that you do in sequence um during the uh, when, when covid first started um, mm -hmm. You know, that's when I started first teaching on Zoom to teach virtual classes. I hadn't taught that at all until then. So, you know, my studio, because I live in New York, we had to close for eight months. That was the state mm. mandate. And a lot of other stu uh, states didn't have to stay closed for that long, but we did. So um, I had to figure out how to stay in business. So, you know, all my clientele at the studio, um, they were on their mats at home with me on Zoom. And, and the other teachers at my studio also taught on Zoom. But, you know, I thought to myself, like, well, they're going to need something to get up off the floor, um, you know, a little bit. So, you know, what can they do? So a lot of people ended up buying the the barrel, the small barrel. Um, and I also rented those out to to them during COVID. So nice. that was that. Yeah. Um, a lot of people also. Uh, well, actually, Sean, um, in the 1990s, worked with stamina, which makes home apparatus. And they, yeah, I'm uh, aware of the name. Yeah, he worked with them to actually create the first home reformers that were based oh, on cool. the home reformers that we were just telling you about that Joe mm -hmm. made. So, so yes. Well, that's I was a good segue there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 
uh, you know, what I did is I tried to reproduce what Joe did. So with stamina, we made the, the, the reformer. We made the chair. We made the barrel. And so you were able to do that. We made, and so that, so I was trying to redo what Joe did and I got a lot of flack. People wouldn't, you know, Joe didn't do that, all this stuff. And historically we now find out that he did do that because, because at the time we didn't know about what he was doing in the forties, right? We didn't know he had that whole line, sure. but I was like, well, this should be able to be, you know, you should be able to do this at home. And so that's what we did and to be able to make that available. And one of the things during the pandemic that, you know, Elaine didn't say is that, I still had about 10 of those home reformers in storage and she sold them all to her clients so that they could do it at home. And you can still Perfect. find the stamina, you know, re uh, portable home reformer, you know, you know, on Google or, or, mm -hmm. you know, eBay or wherever. On the used market. People, yes. On the used yeah. market. Now during the, when the pandemic first hit, they went way up and you couldn't find it. Oh, but yeah. now that it's over, you, you know, we'll see if that happens. But so when you save for the home gym, you know, you can do that. Now, those apparatus are not made to be able to do like a studio apparatus where, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have people come in in eight hours a day, six days a week and over and over and over again. Yeah. But you can still use that. So if you have people that have whole gym with weights and they want to do a little bit of extra work or variability, that's, you know, that's something they could do. You know, I wrote a book with my teacher, Ramana Krasinaska, in, 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 we published it in 1999, I think. Uh, and it was basically the basic workout you know, for the home apparatus. So, uh, you know, I have a book that I, you know, with Ramana and you Perfect. can see that it has, there's the, there's what the barrel that they had, there's the mat work and there's the archival picture of the barrel across the way. So you see that, Sure. you know, and so when you open it up, there's mat work and, and got... it takes you through everything, how to do it all. And then there's, uh, there's wall work that there's exercise on the wall that you can do. Right. So you don't need any apparatus at all. No. Then there's um, uh, wall springs, you know, the near the Cadillac. Okay. Right. So you could, you know, like when the, when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. I put in eye hooks into my closet, you know, frame and nice. I attached springs so I could do my yeah. spring exercises at home. And, and you can see there's in this picture, there's a whole series of Joe doing arm spring exercises. So what that makes me think of are bands. Uh -huh. And yep. how resourceful people got during the COVID shutdown. Yep. I had a coworker that knew that I had a home gym. He mm -hmm. didn't. He was used to working out at a commercial gym. He said, "Hey, do you do you have anything I can borrow? Do you have some bands, something?" And I mm -hmm. lent him some of these, and I also lent him some other things. I lent mm -hmm. another coworker one of my extra barbells and some weights. And yeah, I mean, people that wanted to keep working out and yep. exercising, they kind of like you said with the what did you say it was uh, screwing the eye hooks in? I mean, he was looping a band around a doorknob and do oh, what yeah. he had to do, they, you they, know? You know, in yep. PT, I, I've used TheraBands for 30 years, you know, in PT, which is a, a resistance band. Sure. And they make a special piece that you can buy that you can put into the door, it closes, and it makes a loop. And you just close it, and, and it, it's called a Thera, I think it's Thera loop. Yes. And mm -hmm. you just close it in the door, and it holds it in place, and it won't go anywhere, and you can adjust it and put it in heights. So, you know, that's been going on for a long time, too, but now it's home. So, and then there's the magic circle, which is another one of the apparatus for home. There's the small barrel. You can see here on the small barrel. So here's the second barrel, the, the spine corrector. It's called the spine corrector, right? Okay. And then, then we have the portable reformer. So this book was basically the basic system for the, you know, Pilates. And then there's also the wonder chair. Nice. And I've seen you it. with, you have a wonder chair, correct, Elaine? That's correct, yes. Because that looks familiar. I've seen you post with that. Yes. And I mean, I have to encourage listeners, if they're curious about this, Elaine's uh, Instagram, mm -hmm. is it just your name? Off the top of my head, I'm forgetting now. It is, what is yeah. It? It's Elaine underscore Ewing. Underscore Ewing. Yeah. So we'll drop a link to that, Elaine, in the description. And cool. listeners, if you want to see some of this, um, it's a great resource to check out as well as her website. And then one last thing I wanted to ask both of you, because, uh, you know, it's getting late. I want to be respectful of your time. It's just, I'm curious because I, you know, I'm invested and really passionate about the things that I'm doing in my home gym. Mm -hmm. So as much as I'm curious about Pilates and trying it, realistically, I'm not going to put all my weights on the 
used market tomorrow and sell them <laughs> off to get myself a reformer. So that'll be in about is, six months. Or yeah, so. there you go. <laughs> There you go. It'll it, it's it's like a bug. It'll just get me. <laughs> so, my question is: Is it possible to use Pilates as a complementary? As a you know, if I'm if I really want to, for example, pursue strongman lifts, mm -hmm. can I use Pilates as a complementary thing? Because all of the qualities you named, you know, when it comes to mobility, when it comes to balance, and just the qualities of the things you're naming there. You mentioned the spinal, what was it? The spinal, uh, the spine corrector, spine, the spine corrector. corrector. Yeah. Just the title appears to me, uh, appeals to me. Like <laughs> I'll take it. The yeah. spinal corrector. Well, well That's after great. I'm lifting some strongman <laughs> lifts, please give me the spinal corrector. So <laughs> totally. am I correct in thinking I could supplement in a way and merge of the course. two? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So then, I mean, uh, one, one of the ways ahead. to think, one of the ways to think about it is that, when you're doing Pilates, it's teaching you how to move the way you're designed to move and you're organized to move. And when you do weights and you do all these other things, it's not that you don't, you can't do both. The question, what I found though, is a lot of times that when people do one and they start doing Pilates, not always, it's not for everybody, but a lot of times they, they, they do in six months, they have yeah. more of a Pilates studio. You know, yeah. I have a great story. When, when my teacher, Ramana, we were in the early 90s, I went to a physical therapy conference and, and had a booth, and we were trying to get PTs interested. And, and we had this, you know, Ramana was probably 70 at the time, you know, and she's not a tall woman, she, you know, you know, 70-year-old woman. And this guy comes in, and he's probably like 23, 24, a weightlifter. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what is all this? What can this do? Show <laughs> yeah. me how this works. So she goes, okay, honey, come on over here. And she does an exercise on the Wanda chair, which is called the pull-up. And basically, you hold on to the chair. You have, you know, once, you know, you have the springs, and you have to lift straight up. And it's all about your core, right? So, you know, she shows him how to do it. And then he gets on, and he tries to do it. And he's trying, and he's trying, and he's starting to get red. He's starting to sweat. And he can't do it. He gets off, and he's like, show me that again. <sighs> Right. And she goes, OK, honey, you know, let, come here and let me show you how to do it. And then she started to teach him how to do it. And then he could do it because he was so caught up into his arms and legs and not his core so much. And again, <laughs> that was 30 years ago. So now core is a little bit more integrated. But back Absolutely. then it wasn't. So, you know, when you look at the history. So that's part of the, the difference as well. So that's, you know, and then when I was in PT school, I had one of the guys in my class was trying to be Mr. Universe. So like, and I was a dancer. So like his arm was, you know, bigger than my <laughs> yeah. torso almost. Sure. And we were doing a, a dynamometer, which is, you know, a, 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 it, it has a, a chain and a handle. And then you have a, a, a like a weight on the bottom. When you pull it, it, it measures how much weight you do. Mm. So he and I did it. We were partners and I could do more than he could. And he thought I was cheating. He called the teacher over. <laughs> and, and when we analyzed yeah. it, what was happening is when he did it, he was thinking about just using his arms. And when I did it, I was using my legs, my back and my arms. So when I used my whole body, I could do more than he could with his arms. Mm -hmm. Then when he started to, we, we worked on it and he started to be able to do his legs and his arms and his back. He did a lot more than me, but in the beginning, because of how he was, he was thinking about it and how he was training, you know, he was missing that whole body integration. Well, what you're, you know, everything you're saying, whether it's the core or using the whole body integration, that definitely plays a part. I mean, even just, you know, when I think about something as uh, tried and true as the bench press, I mean, the more you get into lifting, the more you learn, you know, to use your legs with the bench press and that you're right. really, there's a lot of leg drive that goes into it as odd as that might sound. And when it comes to the core, I mean, well, if you have a weak core, you're not going to do well squatting. You're just going to crunch over. So I'm not advanced in either uh, of those disciplines, but you know, even at my knowledge level, everything you're saying makes sense that it'd be a good supplementary and oh, yeah. accessory sure. type of thing that would complement each other, whether you got addicted to it and changed everything in your gym in six months or not. <laughs> but well, I, 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 yes, go ahead, Elaine. I was say, most people um, who do come to Pilates lessons or, or do Pilates at home 
also participate in a lot of different th- uh, sports and activities that they enjoy, like tennis and golf and running and, you know, all the different things, um, you know, even gardening, you know, there's a lot of different things that people enjoy doing activities, physical activities, and Pilates actually complements them. So maybe it'll work your body in ways that you don't normally do when you do your, your favorite activities, or it'll, like Sean was saying, strengthens you in ways that enhances your ability to do what you love to do outside of Pilates. So it's definitely a compliment to, to all different types of, of other kinds of exercises. Well, you've got me intrigued and, uh, you know, I really, I enjoyed looking at your website, Elaine, and I encourage people to check it out. I noticed on there a link, Sean, to the endeavor that you are pursuing. So please, you know, let listeners know. So you mentioned a museum, you mentioned how you're working on the property, you know, where, what are your future plans with that? What are, what's going on? Well, you know, so when I, when I bought the property, I went, I basically had archival pictures of Ted Sean, you know, working with Joe and Ted Sean was at Pilate, at the, you know, Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival. So I went and met with the archivists and I was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll share with you. I'll let you have what I have. You let me have, you know, I had a lot more than he had for Pilates. So we shared. And it, when I was there, he says, well, you know, his property's for sale and I think it has the equipment in it. And oh. I was like, what? <laughs> so I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm there. So I, you know, he got me a, a meeting with the, the realtor and I walk through and then I get to the studio and the studio was in total disrepair and his original house was in not in great shape, but, and there was a lot of water damage because they basically left it for 30 years. Nobody did anything. They just, you know, the roofs, things it was just go sitting. bad. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. So uh, there was a lot of water damage and everything else. But I said to the realtor, I said, well, you know, you tell the owner, I'd be happy to buy the equipment, but I don't think I want the property. And the owner came back and said, if you want the equipment, you got to buy the property. Uh <laughs> so I offered him, you know, I offered him a deal and he took it. And in hindsight, I'm kind of glad I did because if I would have just taken the equipment, I, I'm I'm positive that the studio and the house and everything would have just been torn down mm-hmm. and it would have been lost. And because I didn't, it took me, you know, I started to work on it and I did a lot of it myself. I mean, I rebuilt the roof and reshingled it and rebuilt the deck and, I, you know, I stripped out the insides. The bungalow I, I, I stripped out and everything, like, like the whole rafters, everything was rotted out. Oh, and then geez. like two winters later, there was one of these, you know, huge snowstorms. It was like four feet of snow and everything caved in. Oh. So that's that's the next thing that we're working on now is to rebuild gotcha. the bungalow. The okay. house was where the house was The people who brought the property built a new house on top where that old house was. So, okay. you know, we don't have the house anymore, but, you know, but that's the house I stay in when I go up there. But that's so that's what I'm doing. And, and the goal is to, uh, you know, the studios like right now, it's a working studio, you know, half of it, it's 400 square feet. So half has there's a reformer, there's a Cadillac, there's a chair, you know, Joe's original stuff, uh, you know, and then some newer. Uh, on, uh, well, that, on one side, it's newer stuff, but it's still old. It's like from the 80s and the 90s. Okay. And then on the other side is all of Joe's original equipment that we've uh, cleaned up. We I, I do like these work weekends where we invite people to to come and, you know, volunteer to work and experience the history and everything else. And they come and they clean. And one woman came and like pulled out her toothbrush to clean stuff. I mean, it was really, you know, people get really so, uh, crazy about it. A labor of so, love. Th- so yeah. one side is, one side is a museum and the other that side is, is a cool. working studio. And eventually what I'd like to do, because there's, there, there are, it, it is still 20 acres. He originally had 56, but now it's down to 20. And that's in Massachusetts. I want to build, Yes, it's in, in Western Massachusetts. Gotcha. Uh, uh, what I, what the goal is is what, once we get the bungalow, the, the guest house rebuilt, I can turn it into a bed and breakfast, so people can come and sleep where Joe slept. I I have his original bed nasiums, is the beds that were exercise apparatus. So you would sleep on a bed, and it was a V bed, you know. So mm-hmm. a lot of times when somebody has a back problem, they're told to put a pillow underneath their knee when they sleep on their side to lift it so the back doesn't bend. Mm-hmm. Well, that's built into his bed. So when you, you know, you just can't sleep as couples, you know, you have to sleep singly. Gotcha. But, and then you would wake up, you'd flip a little thing and it would lock it, lock it back up. And then there was, you had springs on the ends of the bed and you do all the, your exercises in the morning in your bed. So he's always fucking, you know, like I, I don't have, I don't have time. I don't have a place. Love it. He, he took care of that. You know, yeah. you, whenever you need time and, and you know, your bed, your chair, 
he made apparatus so that you could you didn't have an excuse door you know the door gym you know everything so and then you know the, the after we get the bungalow done then the next thing would be to you know build a real training studio and a, a okay. big studio to to be able to have equipment and trainings and because that was his dream and we want to keep that dream going that's fantastic and i mean it, do you have a website to see the progress uh, of this to see uh well, we have well instagram i instagram pages yeah. Great. Yeah. So then what's your Instagram, Sean? Well, it's the, the Pilates source. The Pilates source. Is it, okay. It's actually it's the dot, right? dot Pilates dot source. Pilates dot source. Yeah. And, um, gotcha. So we've documented a lot so, of that, the restoration there. And um, I'll make sure yeah. to drop a link for that too, listeners in the description to check that and out. Then we also have, I also, there's also, we, we've done a, a, we have a YouTube channel, the Pilates mm -hmm. The dot Pilates. It's just the right? Pilates source. Uh, the, Pilates the Pilates source. source. And okay. on there, what we've done there is we uh, uh, we did a um, last year in January in 2022. Elaine put it together, and, and we did it with another teacher who just wrote a book on on Joe. Uh, and we did that. It's called Thirty and Thirty, which is it was a 30 year anniversary since I'd bought the business, and so all the different things that I've done since Joe. So there's oh, that. Cool. And then we also have interviews of different people who either worked with Joe. Mm -hmm. There's one guy who was, you know, went to with to Joe's place with his dad to paint the studio and do other cut the grass. Got some great stories. So we have their interviews. We have uh, Joe's barber from the from up in Be Beckett who who, who mm -hmm. became his friend because after the war he had uh, you know <clears throat> he had a little bit of uh, stress from the the war and Joe sort of helped him you know come back and deal with everything you know tony carlina who is joe's we call him joe's barber joe's he just barber. passed away this past year oh sorry he was to hear 90 yeah. 94 i think wow you know, and, but but we interviewed him at at the pilates at the pillow so that that's going to be, be be put on there as well so there's, if they if they're interested in some of the history we have lots of history that they can go on on the youtube channel as well I have not been on the YouTube channel, but like I told you, I'm intrigued, so I'll be going there. And that's a great resource that if viewers and listeners are curious for more information, check out the YouTube channel. Well, thank you both so much for coming yep. on. I mean, I have thank learned. Thank you for having us. I've learned a lot in a short amount of time, and I've been jotting down notes of things I want to look up further and I want to see further. Awesome. So thank you so much. I'll definitely keep in contact. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm not ruling out a Zoom session, yeah. uh, Elaine. So I, I am curious. Yeah, that'd be really fun. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. I, I also am a fan yeah. of your work, too, because I know you do a lot of restoration on all the different weights and you have so much, uh, such a depth of knowledge about these things. So I really find, you know, your posts super interesting too. And, and that was really fun to connect with you on, on that, the level of restoring yeah, and, equipment. And she's turned me on to your, she's turned me on to your site as well. So yeah. it's like, oh, cool. we're all connecting and seeing it, yeah. but it's great because it's, it's looking at the history and, and trying to get as, as close to, to, to what it is as possible. And we're mm -hmm. always finding more and new things. Mm -hmm. And it's all of a sudden it's, we thought it was this. Oh no. Now we have proof. It was that. No, mm -hmm. now we, you know, so. These are things that are happening on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's my goal with this podcast is to try to preserve the history and mm -hmm. try to spread the history. So I hope yeah. that some listeners that like myself didn't know too much about Pilates are now heading down that path. So cool. thank you both. Thank you so I hope much. You have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you very you much too. for having us. Thanks. Right. Appreciate it. Bye.